Well, grace and peace today. We continue our sermon series um, called Just Jesus. What are we talking about? Just Jesus, right? And uh, uh, this summer sermon series focuses on the gospel passages in the Revised Common Lectionary. And today, we're talking about one of my very favorite stories, the parable of the Good Samaritan. You like this story? It's a great story, isn't it? Right? And uh, everyone knows this story, at least knows the phrase, the Good Samaritan. I mean, it's a kind of a, a cultural phrase that means somebody who helps somebody else out in need, right? You want to be a Good Samaritan. A Good Samaritan helps somebody else out. And guess what hospital I was born in in Cincinnati? Good Samaritan Hospital. Now, the interesting thing that I'll kind of guide our conversation is there is not a good, let, let's just kind of go through, there's not a good Jewish hospital, there's not a good American hospital, there's not a good Muslim hospital. Good Samaritan means something because there weren't good Samaritans in that day. So I'll help that be in the back of our mind. Now, before we get into the text today, I came across a really cool story uh, yesterday and I was like, ooh, this will be really good to share today. It connects so well. It's, it's about a boy named Brody. I think we have his picture. There's Brody and his mom. Brody just graduated from sixth grade. He was bullied in fifth grade, so his mom transferred him to a charter school in hopes that he would fit in better there. But unfortunately, he was bullied also in the charter school. He graduated from sixth grade, and to the end of the school year, what do kids do? They pass their yearbooks around so each other would sign their yearbooks. They did this even way back when, when I was in school, a long time ago. And uh, they would sign each other's names and maybe share a funny story or a memory and how much we'll miss you and all those things. But when Brody went around to his classmates and asked his classmates to share or to write and to sign his yearbooks, the classmates said, no. And uh, unfortunately for Brody, he only got two signatures, and they were from teachers. And so on the yearbook, we would put this, he wrote himself a note. He says, I hope you make some more friends. Signed, Brody Ritter. He brought his yearbook home in his backpack, and his mom went in his backpack and found the yearbook, and she opened the yearbook to the signatures, and her heart just broke. Would your heart break if that was your kid or your grandkid? Brody was not able to uh, connect with his, his classmates. He was different, and unfortunately, his classmates didn't want to connect with him either. So the mom got on a mom's Facebook group that evening, and she shared the story about how disappointed and hurt she was that her son didn't get any signatures on the yearbook. The next day, uh, a whole bunch of high school kids who heard about the story of Brody and his yearbook showed up at Brody's classroom, and all of the kids signed the yearbook. So let's see, I think we have a picture of the kids showing up. Brody, Brody's surrounded by all those old kids. How do you think he feels? He's probably, this is cool. He looks kind of embarrassed. But look at his yearbook after these older kids showed up. Isn't that awesome? Such a great story. Such a great story. And then some of the kids took him out for ice cream. Next picture. There he is hanging out with some older kids. He probably felt like he was one of the cool ones now. But it doesn't stop there. A actor uh, named Paul Rudd, who plays Ant-Man, there he is, Paul Rudd, he heard about Brody. So Paul Rudd decided that he wanted to do something. So Paul, Rode, Paul Rudd called Brody's mom, and so Brody got to talk to him. And then um, he got a text message from Paul Rudd. Text message said, I sent you something. It should show up today, I think. Brody says, okay, thanks. And then uh, Paul gave him a thumbs up and says, you got it, buddy. And then uh, Brody says, you're my favorite superhero. And then Paul Rudd, who played Ant-Man, says, you're mine. How do you think that made him feel? So good. So he got this letter in the mail. It says, Dear Brody, it was great talking to you the other day. It's important to remember that even when life is tough, that things get better. There are so many people that love you and think you're the coolest kid there is, me being one of them. 
I can't wait to see all the amazing things you're going to accomplish. And then he gave him a Ant-Man helmet, and it says, to my good friend Brody, for when, we, for when he takes on the world, signed Paul Rudd, Ant-Man. And afterwards, here's a picture of his face. Now, why did I share that story? It's a good story, right? It's a good inspiring story of people helping out a kid in need. But really, it is about these questions. How does it feel not to be included? And then the second question is, how does it feel to be included? Now, if we want to, we can, we can uh, imagine what Brody would have felt like. And I imagine somewhere in our lives, we have been in Brody's shoes, haven't we? Is there some time in our life where we didn't feel included? Maybe it was in school when you were left out. Maybe everybody was invited to a party except for you. But maybe as an adult, the same thing happens. A bunch of people at work go out and you're not included. Or maybe even in our own family, things like this take place. We all know what it's like not to feel included. And it is a terrible, terrible feeling. Would we all agree, nod your head. How about the other question? How does it feel to be included? How did Brody feel after he received that attention? How does it feel to be welcomed and included, an outsider becoming an insider? It feels amazing, right? Because one of the deep things that every single person on the planet needs is to be known and seen. To be seen and known. To be known that we exist, that somebody notices who we are. And Brody was known and seen. And so today, as we talk about the parable of the product, I'm sorry, parable of the Good Samaritan, uh, we're going to talk about what does it mean to be a neighbor, what does it mean to be a stranger, and how God desires for us not to be strangers from one another, but yet to be family. And with that in mind, let's jump into the story of the Good Samaritan. Now, the parable of the Good Samaritan for me and the numerous times I preached on this particular parable oftentimes comes across with the message, hey, we need to take care of people in need. We need to be compassionate to people in need. And I believe that is a very important part of the parable of the Good Samaritan. But I believe there's more. And this is the thing that we often miss. The parable of the Good Samaritan wasn't just about us showing compassion to one another, even though that is vitally important. The parable goes much deeper, exposing our biases, our hatred, and those that we declare as enemies. And God's desire for all of us to bridge that gap so that we can become the family that God desires us to be. This is an important message for us individually, because we all have enemies, right? We all have people that get underneath our skin, right? We all have people that annoy us. Some of you are looking at me. I'm sorry. Forgive me, please. We all have people that upset us. That's just the way life rolls. And how do we deal with it, right? But this is super important for us as a church, too, right? Who are we going to be known as as a church? Are we going to be known as a church that welcomes the outsider? Are we going to be the type of people that knocks down the walls and builds the bridges to those that are different from us? Or are we going to be like this lawyer, this religious scholar that has decided that he already knows who his neighbor is and he only wants to associate and love who he wants to associate and love? So today the big idea is this, and this might seem a little odd, But I'll build the connection here as we go. Jesus calls you to love your neighbor as you love yourself. You know that, right? That's the great commandment. But this is where the parable of the Good Samaritan comes in. And to love the stranger because you know what it's like to be a stranger. To love the alien because you know what it's like to be an alien. You, uh, to, to love the outsider because you know what it's like to be an outsider. To love the immigrant because you know what it's like to be an immigrant. That's where we're going to get to today. So let's dig in. If you have your Bible, you can open it up. If not, uh, we're going to have some scriptures 
on the screen. I, I got the message translation just to read a different version of the uh, scriptures than what Jay and read. And so the very beginning of the parable, this kind of right before the parable and what sets up the parable is uh, these few verses. Uh, just then a religion scholar stood up with a question to test Jesus. Teacher, what do I need to inherit or to get eternal life? He said, this is Jesus, he answered, what's written in God's law? How do you interpret it? He said, this is the lawyer responding, or the religious scholar says, that you love the Lord your God with all your passion and prayer and muscle and intelligence, uh, or all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and that you love your neighbor as well as you do yourself. Good answer, Jesus said. Do it, and you'll live. Now, this is important. This is a setup. So we have a lawyer or a scholar. Uh, Luke is not really positive when it comes to lawyers, scholars. If you read Luke and read Acts, you kind of see that Luke exposes the religious scholar, these lawyers, these uh, uh, students of the law, uh, as having a very selfish uh, nature. And so that kind of gives us a hint that this guy isn't necessarily pure at heart. He comes to Jesus and says, and even says in the text, that he has a question to test Jesus. So you can see his motives aren't very good. He, ex he calls Jesus teacher instead of maybe Lord or master or rabbi. And so the, even the terminology isn't as respectful as maybe others would. And he comes to Jesus and asks the question, what must I do to get eternal life? And I love the way the message translates it. Some of the other translations translate it, inherit eternal life. Here in the Greek, it, it really talks about this guy wants to know how he can actually get eternal life, like a ticket to heaven. He really wants a transaction. He really wants uh, to, to purchase or receive a gift, and so he can put it in his back pocket and know that when he dies, he will be part of the resurrection, because that's what the Jews believed. Everybody except the Sadducees, all the Jews believed that at the end of time, there would be a resurrection from the dead, and all the good Jewish people, not the evil Samaritans, but all the good Jewish people would be resurrected. And so this man's asking, how do I get assurance that I will have eternal life? And so it's kind of like a checklist. He has a checklist mentality. If I, what, is it, what do I need to do? Do I need to put a certain amount of money in the offering plate? Do I need to post certain Bible verses on Facebook? How do I, can, what can I do to get my ticket to heaven? What was the transaction? And so what we see here with this idea of eternal life, Jesus did not look at it as a transaction, did he? He did not think of eternal life as something that you receive, like a ticket you put in your, put in your back pocket. In fact, in the Gospel of John, chapter 17, verse 3, Jesus gives us a definition of eternal life. This would be one of those verses in your Bible that you might want to circle or star because this is super important. Jesus gives us a definition of eternal life. He says, this is eternal life. To know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you sent. Now that word know is a relational term. It's not a mental term. It's a relational, like a husband knows their wife. It's a relational, intimate term. And so what Jesus is saying, eternal life is a relationship with God and Jesus. Eternal life isn't a ticket you put in your back pocket with the hopes that you get to heaven one day. Eternal life is a relationship that begins now and is ongoing and that goes into eternity. That's what. And so this man, this lawyer, this religious scholar wants the ticket to heaven. And Jesus says, I want a relationship with you. So you see the tension there? That's what's going on in the Greek. That's what's going on behind the scenes is this tension that the religious, religious uh, uh, scholar just wants a ticket to heaven. And Jesus wants a relationship. And so Jesus responds with a question, what is your interpretation of scripture? And so this religious scholar is literate, he knows how to read, and most of that culture did not, so he was part of the elite. And so Jesus asked him not just what does the Torah say or the law say, Jesus said, how do you interpret 
the law? How do you interpret what the scriptures say? And he responds, he responds with um, uh, two, two ideas. Uh, and he responds with the first one is he says, to love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And that's straight from Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5 is the Shema which is to hear, O Israel, the Lord God is one. Love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And so this religious scholar took that verse, which was very popular, and it was prayed multiple times a day by Jewish people, and he says that's a good summary of what it means to have a, a relationship with God. And then he gave another verse straight from our favorite book in the Bible, Leviticus. And so from Leviticus he says, to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Aren't you glad we have Leviticus in the Bible? Because if we don't have Leviticus in the Bible, we don't have love your neighbor as you love yourself. That's where it's from. And so this religious scholar, this lawyer says, love God with your everything and love your neighbor as you love yourself. Those are two good things. I want to dip a little bit into Leviticus for a second because this is really at the heart of what the parable of the Good Samaritan is. If you go to Leviticus, chapter 8, 9, this is chapter 19, verse 18. This is where we get to love your neighbor. In fact, in Leviticus, it only has the, the, the concept of uh, love only in this chapter. It says, you must not take revenge nor hold a grudge against any of your people or fellow Israelites. Instead, you must love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. And so that's where we get it from, right there, that verse. So if you would look at this verse, who would you say is the neighbor that we are to love as ourselves. Just reading this verse, you must not take revenge nor hold a grudge against any of your people. Who would you think the neighbor is here? Fellow Jewish people, right? That's what it says, right? Uh, against any of your people. Now, one of the things that's important is in the synagogue, they would have kind of a lectionary like we do, but they just wouldn't read a verse, they would read an entire chapter. Every time that was the red, and remember, people weren't literate and didn't have the Bible in their homes. In the times of Jesus, they would only hear the scriptures uh, recited and they would memorize it in, um, in, in the synagogue. And so later in Leviticus chapter 19 is this verse, verse 34. Any immigrant who lives with you must be treated as if they were one of your citizens. You must love them as yourself because you were immigrants in the land of Egypt, I am the Lord your God. Now this is super, super important here. Do you see what Jesus is saying? In that first verse, verse number 18, it said that we are to love our fellow uh, um, Israelites as we love ourselves. But in this verse, who does Jesus extend that love of neighbor to? To the immigrants, to the strangers, to the aliens, to those who have come along the Jewish people on the journey towards the promised land. All of these people who have just kind of come in with the Jewish people. Now imagine, imagine a million people exiting Egypt, right? Imagine a million slaves exiting Egypt and they're traveling through the wilderness for 40 years and they pick up, pick up stranglers. They pick up these extra people, these strangers. They pick up extra people along the way. Who does God say how to treat, how does God say to treat those people who are not like them, people who speak other languages, people who eat differently? How does God say to love those strangers? He says to love them as you would love yourself, to include the stranger, to include the immigrant, to include even people that you don't like who are now part of your community. Now this is important because this is the reason that Jesus tells the parable of the Good Samaritan, is to make sure that religious scholar and all of us understand that love of neighbor isn't just the people who look like us and talk like us, but it's also those strangers and people who are different than us. All right, so let's, uh, let's, let's keep going here, and let's see. So let's, he then says, uh, the religious scholar says, to Jesus. He says, looking for a loophole, he asks, and how would you define neighbor? Jesus answered him by telling a story, a parable. There was once a man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. Another way, he was attacked by robbers. They took his clothes, beat him up, and went off, leaving him half dead. 
Luckily, a priest was on his way down the same road, but when he saw him, he angled across the other side. I always think that's funny. It was on the other side of the road, right? It's like when I'm walking the dog and I see other dogs on the other side of the sidewalk. I cross over with my dog because I know Chloe. Chloe's going to go after that dog on the sidewalk. So anyway, uh, Then a Levite religious man showed up, and he avoided the injured man. A Samaritan traveling the road came on him, and when he saw the man's condition, his heart went out to him. He gave him first aid, disinfecting and bandaging his wounds, and he lifted him onto his donkey, led him to his inn, and made him comfortable. In the morning, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take good care of him. If it costs any more, put it on my bill, and I will pay you on my way back. So let's talk about this a little bit. So what we hear is that the religious man's asking for a loophole, he wants permission just to love the people he wants to love. And so Jesus tells him this parable, this story. Now, the word parable uh, comes from this idea of parallel. It's the idea of, of, of two stories. There's our story, and then a parable is another story that is, is runs, a parable runs parallel to our story. So we have two stories. This is the story we're living, and this is the story that helps us understand something. It runs parallel to us. So this parable tells the story of a man going from Jerusalem to Jericho. This is a downhill, and it's uh, many miles, and it was known for it to be a very dangerous place. So the people that were hearing the story would have understood that there was danger, and he got attacked by robbers. Robbers beat him up, left him half dead, robbed him of his stuff, and uh, left him half dead. So there is the man in the ditch on the side of the road, half dead. Luckily, a priest was on his way down the same road, and then also a, Levi, a Levite religious man showed up. And uh, both of those men uh, decided to avoid the hurt man in the ditch. Now, a lot of people will talk about this particular parable and say, well, the reason that the Levite and religious man avoided the half-dead man is because they did, he didn't want to be unclean. And uh, the commentaries say that's not true. The reason that the Levite and the priest avoided the man was they were selfish. And uh, they avoided him because they thought maybe there was danger and maybe there was something that could um, hurt them. And so they avoided the man. Now, it's interesting that the uh, third person, if you were a Jewish person, uh, there's three groups of people. There is the uh, priests, there is the Levite, and then there's all the other Israelites. So in their mind, there's three groups of people. There's a priest, and there's a Levite, and the Israelite. So when they heard this story, when Jesus got to that third person, they expected it to be an Israelite. And Jesus pulled the rug out from underneath them and, ex and exposed something. He said the third person was a Samaritan. Now it's very important that we understand that Jewish people and Samaritans did not like each other at all. Uh, Jewish people would call Samaritans rapists and murderers. And the reason is, is there's stories back in the Old Testament of uh, Samaritans, uh, a Samaritan being a rapist and a Samaritan being a murderer. So the Jewish people stereotyped. We still do that, don't we? We still stereotype people. If you have one person from a country who's a murderer, they're all murderers, right? We do this all the time. And so here, that's what we had. And so Jesus says that the Samaritan actually did something good, a good Samaritan. There is no good Samaritans in the minds of Jews. That's what this story is about. We have two groups of enemies. We have the Jews and we have the uh, Samaritans, and they don't like each other at all. They like the blues and the yellows, right? But what we understand here is Jesus is saying that yellow person, that Samaritan person, is actually your neighbor even if you don't realize it. And so you should love that neighbor because that neighbor actually in this story actually loves a Jewish person. And so this would have been a countercultural revolutionary story. And unfortunately for us, we know it so well. We've heard it so many times. We just summarize it by we should help people in need. But it's much deeper than that, isn't it? It's about helping people that are different than us. Of course, we should help people in need that are right around us, people that look like us, people that talk like us. But specifically, Jesus says our neighbor is also the person across the wall, a person across the fence. The, 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 our neighbor is someone who looks like, uh, doesn't look like us. Our neighbor is also somebody who doesn't speak like us, maybe from a different 
uh, country or different ethnicity. Jesus is really, really trying to get this religious scholar and the byproduct of us reading the Gospel of Luke is all of us to know that our neighbor isn't necessarily somebody who looks like us. And so it's really interesting. Martin Luther King Jr. preached on this particular sermon or this particular text several times. And uh, one of the things that he did, and I, I think this is fantastic exposition, he said the first two people, the Levite and the priest, they were concerned. The question that they were asking is what, if I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? That's what the Levite and the priest was thinking. If I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? Maybe I'll be robbed. Maybe I'll get beat up. Maybe I will have my stuff stolen. Um, but Martin Luther King Jr. in his sermon says the Samaritan asked a different question. And this question that the Good Samaritan asked, if I don't stop and help this person, what will happen to him? See the difference? The first two people were saying, if I stop to help this person, what will happen to me? But the Samaritan was saying, if I don't stop to help this person, what will happen to him? And notice the difference. One is selfish and one is selfless, willing to risk, willing to put themselves in danger to help somebody who is different than them. And the reality is, from Jesus' perspective and what Paul speaks in the New Testament, is we're all created in the image of God, no matter what color we are, right? And God loves all of us equally and desires for his family, the church, to be made up of all those people that represent humanity. In fact, Paul calls it the new humanity. People from all different races and colors and, and uh, languages all coming together. In the book of Revelation, what do we see? At the marriage supper of the Lamb, we see this beautiful mosaic of all different people from all different countries, all worshiping Jesus. So Jesus, bringing his kingdom of God uh, amongst the Jewish people, is helping them understand what the future is like. There is no walls. There is no uh, fences to divide people between uh, races and ethnicities. And then the, the, the last part of this parable, uh, which I, I think is really, really interesting. Let me get back to this text here. So Jesus says, uh, what do you think? He asked the lawyer. He says, uh, which of the three became a good neighbor to the man attacked by the robbers? So instead of saying, who's my neighbor? Jesus asked, which of these three became a neighbor to the man who was attacked by robbers? And so the lawyer, who could not say the name Samaritan because they didn't even say the names of their enemies, wouldn't even verbalize it. What does the, the lawyer say? The one who treated him kindly. The one who showed him mercy. All of this is to expose our hearts. Jesus says, go and do the same. Go and do likewise. So the big idea is this. Thank you. Jesus calls you, calls me, calls us to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. And to love the stranger because we know what it's like to be a stranger. Those Israelites, they were strangers in Egypt. They were slaves in Egypt, and they remember what it was like not to be included. And we talked about it at the very beginning. We all know what it's like to be Brody. We all know what it's like to be not included. And so Jesus says in his explanation of the verse from Leviticus that we should love our neighbor who looks like us and talks like us, but we also should love the outsider, the Brodies in the world, and the people from different cultures and ethnicities, because we know what it knows what it feels like not to be included. So who's my neighbor? Well, my neighbor is uh, the people who live next door. Your neighbor is the people who live next door to you, right? Our neighbors are our physical neighbors, right? The people that look like us and talk like us. And maybe your neighbors don't look like you and talk like you, but our neighbors are those that we live in proximity to. We live in neighborhoods. Those are full of neighbors, right? We live in a city. What are we full of? We're full of neighbors. People that we live with are neighbors. But Jesus wants us to understand that those who are different than us are also our neighbors. And that command to love your neighbor as you love yourself goes all the way to love your enemy. So people who are different than us, people who are immigrants, people who from different ethnicities, countries, different 
languages, uh, people uh, from different sexual orientations, people from different political parties, people from different religion, anyone who is different, Jesus says for us to love. Jesus says for us to love everyone, everywhere, always. I came across this, uh, actually Rebecca sent me this uh, meme, uh, this from Bob Goff. Do we have that blue quote? Not that one. That one there. There's no school to learn how to love your neighbor. No one expects us to love them flawlessly. But we can, can, we can love them fierce, fearlessly, furiously, and unreasonably. We are called to love our neighbors. So, what is the next step that God is asking you to take today? We have next step cards. I encourage you each and every week to fill this out and hand it to someone to keep you accountable for what God is calling you to do. If we all do this, we all will grow. And if you have no one that you have to hand it to, please hand it to me in the uh, narthex after the service. That book I read to the, the kids has a few questions at the end of it, so I'm going to ask you those questions to close our sermon. Where are you in the story? Are you the person robbed? Are you one of the people that crossed over on the other side of the road to avoid the robber? Are you the good Samaritan? Or are you the robber? Can you name groups to which you belong and groups to which you do not? Do you ever think that your group is better than others? Have you ever helped someone who was not part of your group? Has someone you didn't know or who wasn't your friend ever helped you? Have you ever been scared of someone? Have you ever been afraid to do something even though you knew it was the right thing to do? Can you think of ways to become a better neighbor and a better friend to those in your life? Let us pray together. Jesus, I pray today that you will give us the eyes to see like you see. To see our neighbors and our strangers and the people that we meet. And teach us to love everyone. To love the stranger. To love our neighbor. To love everyone as we love ourselves. Forgive us of our selfishness, for our silence, for not caring enough for the strangers who come into our communities and teach us to love and care for the strangers the way that you do. We pray this in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen.